Okay, thank you very much, David. And it's certainly a pleasure to uh, have this privilege tonight. As David has mentioned, my name is Andrew Usher, and uh, I live with my wife and family just outside the city of Toronto in Ontario. And we are part of the local assembly, the local church of Christians that meets in a building called the New Market Gospel Hall, a little town just on the outskirts, the northern edge of the city of Toronto. So it's a privilege to be associated with the Christians that gather in the Midland Park Gospel Hall in uh, putting out this live stream gospel message tonight. So I hope that if you're listening, God will use this message from his word tonight as a blessing to your soul. I'm going to read a passage of scripture, a little short section from the Bible, and it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul speaks in verse 1 about uh, urging that prayers will be made. Verse 2, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Now I read that extended passage there just to set the uh, the context of the little section I really want to look at. Paul, the writer here, the Apostle Paul, he's explaining to these first century people he was writing to um, a number of things about God. And in doing this, he explicitly says, I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. So in other words, he's just giving extra emphasis to the fact that the statements he has just made are absolutely true. So I want to just pull out a segment of what he says, really the heart of what he says. At the end of verse 3, we have this description given of God. It speaks about that which is pleasing in the sight of, and here it is, God our Savior. Listen to what these verses say. God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. We live in an era with perhaps uh, more so than any generation before us with the advent of social media and the availability of so much information at our fingertips and so many voices clamoring for our attention and so much input streaming in by what we see and what we hear, that probably more than any other generation before us, we get information coming in. But does that help us know the truth? Or does it hinder us knowing the truth? Is it possible that lost in the, the tremendous noise and with all of the different angles of, of things being reported and the, the, the reliability of the information the reports are based on and the bias of those reporting it, is it possible that we are living in an age where the truth itself, the truth, it is not becoming easier to determine? In many ways, maybe it's becoming harder. Now, I'm not at all interested in conspiracy theories or politics or anything else tonight. I am interested in the gospel. The message of the Bible for you and for me from a living God who cannot lie. And basically what I would like to point out tonight from this little passage of scripture is this. That there are five statements made in this passage that are absolutely true. Objectively true. Now what that means is that these statements are completely true, always true, will only ever be true, can never be untrue. An absolute truth, that means that I could go anywhere in history. 
I could go back 500 years or forward 10 years, or I could go anywhere geographically. I could go anywhere on this globe. And if I found a human being and I was able to communicate in a way that they understood in their language, I could make these statements and they would be true. I could go to anybody of any religion. I could go to anybody of any walk in life, rich, poor, young, old, any race. And for every human being in every situation at every point in human history, these statements are true. So I want to emphasize that because we live in a relativistic age where, where you know, even hear people saying things like, you know, this is my truth, or I would like to encourage you to speak your truth. I can speak my experience, I can talk about my perspective. But I don't really have my truth, and you don't really have your truth. There is only the truth when it comes to these statements, and these statements are true. But my dear friend tonight, what I really want to stress is that it's therefore critically important for you and for me to accept these statements because they're true. So we have five statements here that are made from this little passage that give us really the foundational elements of the gospel message, the message that the Bible and the God of the Bible has for you and for me. People say the Bible is very complicated. It is complex, but the basic message of the Bible for you and me is very simple. The first thing that I want to point out from these verses that is an absolute truth is this. There is one God. We read that in verse five. For there is one God. You know, the Bible never sets out to try to argue, to prove, and convince somebody that there's a God. In fact, the very, very, very first words in the Bible simply make a statement in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Whether I choose to believe that or not, whether you choose to believe that or not, <clears throat> doesn't change the truth. That's the thing about the truth. We can't change it. It is what it is. So there is one God. There are not multiple gods. There's not different ways of viewing a deity. There's not some supreme being that we can mold or shape according to our thinking. There's not just a life force in the universe, and we're all at liberty to come up with our own way of describing this life force and relating to it. The message of the Bible is a message that has a foundation that makes a statement of truth. There is one God. He exists outside of us. He is above us. He is beyond us. And we are accountable to him. He's our creator. That is the message of the Bible. There is one God. And I would love tonight if the spirit of God would just drive that truth home to your soul. <clears throat> I'm not sure if there's anyone listening tonight that has any difficulty accepting that as the truth or not. If there is, then I just want to say respectfully, this is not a bigoted message. It's not a biased message. We're not looking down at anyone. We're not claiming superiority to anyone. We are simply appealing to you to recognize that there are things beyond you or me that are absolutely true. And the first such statement found in this passage of the Bible is this, there is one God. And just before I leave that point, let me just say what that means. That means that this has nothing to do with religion. It's not that certain people have one God and they're called monotheists and other people have multiple gods and they're called uh, polytheists or other people decide that there's no God and they are called atheists and other people don't even know if there's a God or not and they're called agnostics. That may be a, a, a tidy way for sociologists uh, or anthropologists to divide up humanity as to what people think or what people believe. But what people think and what people believe doesn't make something true. So to every human being on the planet, this statement is true. Whether they believe it or not, it's true. There is one 
God. But the second statement that I want to bring to your attention from this passage that's absolutely true is this. We are all lost. We're at a distance from this one God. Now, you may say, well, where do you see that in the passage? Well, listen to the passage again with me. We read in the beginning of the end of verse three, God, our savior, verse four, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man. Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So this passage tells us that we need to be saved. God's desire is that all will be saved. And this passage tells us that there is the need of a mediator, someone who will go between men and God. There is one God, there is one mediator between God and men. Therefore, it is absolutely true that we are at a distance from God by nature. There would be no need for a mediator if men and God were in communion. But the fact is we're not. We are separated from God. We're at a distance from God. And there is therefore a need for a mediator who can bridge that gap and bring us together. The idea of saying that God desires all people to be saved also gives irrefutable proof that we are all lost because we all need to be saved. Just this past October marked the 10th anniversary, October 2020, marked the 10th anniversary of, uh, I guess, world famous um, rescue that took place in Chile. And for those of you who are older than maybe just children who are listening, if you were an adult in 2010, then like me, I'm sure you will remember that drama as it unfolded, that real life, nothing staged about it. It wasn't a made for TV reality series. It was real. As there were 33 men trapped in a mine. August the 5th, 2010, the mine we were working in, part of it collapsed. 33 men were trapped. And those men spent 69 days about 2,300 feet below the surface of the earth. They were trapped. They were going to die. They were perishing. They needed to be saved. Now, if I had gone to the office uh, sometime in late August or through September of 2010, and I just happened to, to mention to a colleague, boy, I sure hope those miners are saved. I hope those miners are rescued. Do you think they would have wondered who I was talking about? I wasn't talking about miners in Kirkland Lake, Canada, although there are miners in Kirkland Lake, Canada. I wasn't talking about miners in South Africa or miners in Russia or China. If I said, I hope those miners are saved, to one of my colleagues, they would understand in an instant who I was referring to. I was referring to the miners who were stuck, the miners who were perishing, the miners who were trapped, the miners, 33 of them who needed to be saved. Could I try to impress on you tonight that one of the great truths of the gospel that you need to understand is that we need to be saved? This illustration that I've used of these Chilean miners, that's you and that's me in terms of where we are before God. Maybe the reason you're not saved tonight is because you have never come to grips with this fact that you need to be saved. Lord Jesus, when he was here on earth, he said, those that are healthy don't need a physician. It's those that are sick. Now, that's a, a medical metaphor, but it's exactly the same point that he's making. People that are not lost don't need to be found. People who are not perishing don't need to be saved. But this verse says that God desires all people to be saved, and that is because all people are lost. All people are perishing. That is an absolute truth. But my dear friend listening tonight, while that is a universal truth that applies to everyone, all need to be saved. What I really would like you to come to grips with tonight is that that means you need to be saved. 
I'm so thankful that the Spirit of God worked in my life through the truth of the gospel to bring me to realize that I needed to be saved. Have you ever come to grips with that? Maybe you're listening tonight and you think, well, this is interesting. It's sort of as though it's something that you're just standing at a distance, surveying and studying. And Could I just interrupt your studying and your uh, perspective on this to respectfully say, this is something that's absolutely true. Whether you feel it or don't feel it, whether you think you agree or you don't agree, with all due respect tonight, it doesn't change the truth of it. And this is not my truth. This is the truth. This is God's truth. This is universally true. You need to be saved. That is the absolutely fundamentally necessary background to the gospel. There is not a soul on earth or already in heaven saved by the grace of God who has never been willing to acknowledge I'm lost and I need to be saved. I'm perishing. I need to be rescued. Think of those 33 miners trapped down there in the earth for all of those weeks. No one would have had to convince those men. We're lost. We're trapped. We're perishing. We're helpless. <clears throat> when the message finally came down, and they sent a little note back up saying, we're here, we're safe. And they began to understand that there was a rescue mission underway. Morale began to rise, and those men began to realize that we are lost, we are perishing, but there are those that are coming to rescue us and help us. The second great truth, universal, absolute truth that we have in this passage, not only there is one God, but secondly, we are all lost. We need to be saved. We're at a distance from God. We need someone to bring us together. But there is a third great truth in this passage. And it's really an amazing one. We read about this God in verse 3, that he is in his very essence described as God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved. That is the God of the Bible. He's not an angry God that wants to judge and condemn. He is a holy God. And that's important to recognize. He is an uncompromisingly pure, holy God. He cannot tolerate sin. He can't overlook sin. He can't redefine sin. He can't come up with some middle ground that says bad sinners will be punished, but you know the, 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 the margin for acceptance is here. If you meet some decent level of moral acceptance and you're a good citizen and a, a, a well-meaning person and you're sincere and you try to help others, and somehow that is the standard of sin that he will accept. That might sound feasible or reasonable to us, but it is totally foreign to the character of God. God's character is absolutely holy, righteous, sinless. Absolutely nothing of sin can coexist with God. And as I've already said, we, we are lost, all of us. We are sinners, all of us. We need to be saved. But the amazing truth of the gospel message is this, that God, this holy, righteous, impeccable God, he actually looks on us with love. He looks on us with interest. He looks on us as a savior, God, our savior. And his desire is that all will be saved. Now, could I just make that personal? You know, sometimes with the gospel message, I worry that people think, well, this is universal. It's for all. It's for everybody. Yes, it is. It is for everybody. But what's critical is for you to understand that because it's for everybody, it's for me. And for you, my friend, tonight, I pray to God that you'll understand. Yes, it's for everybody. But what really is important for you to come to grips with is it's for you, for you. So you need to recognize there is one God and you need to recognize that you need to be saved. But thirdly, friend, you need to recognize. Listen to this amazing truth. That God 
desires that you would be saved. That's as simply and as plainly as I can put it. He knows you by name. And if there happens to be someone else out there that shares the same name, he knows you as distinct from anyone else. My name is Andrew Usher. My grandfather's name was Andrew Usher. I have an uncle called Andrew Usher. A little town in Northern Ireland, Limavady, there's a gravestone says Andrew Usher. Well, it's obviously not me because I'm talking to you. It's my grandfather. But God knows me actually even more so than just knowing my name. He knows me. Whatever the, 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 the most individualized identifier is known to science. Now it would be DNA. Well, well God knew DNA before any scientist developed it. He, knew, he knows me, the real individual, unique being that's me. He knows me. Friend, he knows you. He knows you to your core. And he loves you. And his desire is that you would be saved. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. The Bible says that this is absolutely true. You say, well, I don't really feel that. I, I just don't know. I mean, I feel alone. I feel lost. I don't feel any connection with God. I, one of the problems we have now is we've, we've bought into this idea that reality is based on what I feel. No, reality is reality. How I feel is affected by reality. So whether you feel that God loves you or not really isn't the point. The point is that God does love you. And we're going to find out how we know that God loves you. But truth number three is that it is God's desire that you would be saved. But then truth number four. This verse goes on to tell us there is this God, our Savior. He desires all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is one God. But now listen, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The message of the gospel is a message that doesn't just tell us that we're perishing. That would be a bleak message. It's essential that we come to grips with that and understand it and accept it because it's true. The gospel message does confront us with the truth of our condition. We're perishing, but it doesn't leave us there. It goes on to tell us that there's a God whose desire it is to save us. That's amazing, but it doesn't leave us there. It actually tells us that this God whose desire it is to save us, this is what he's done. He has come down to his own creation and the son of God came and was born as a man. Well, he was born as a baby. He was born as a human being. He grew up to be a man, Jesus of Nazareth. And the message of the gospel is how this one, the son of God from heaven, he came into the world to put into motion God's great rescue plan. I'm not going to take time tonight to go into all the details of that Chilean mine disaster. You can Google it and read up on them yourself. It's history now. They've made a movie about it. But it was an amazing rescue plan. Millions and millions of dollars and a multinational team of experts and drilling three different big uh, columns, cores down to reach those people in a specially designed capsule. NASA was involved to go and bring them up. An elaborate costly complex plan but you know the best thing about that plan for those miners is the plan worked and 33 men were saved well you know god has a plan and god implemented his plan and the message of the gospel is a message that tells us the absolute truth that jesus christ this one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus he came and he gave himself as a ransom for all. Now you'll notice again, we've got this little word, all. Yes, we are all lost. But what matters is that I understand that means that I am lost. God desires that all will be saved. But what really matters for me is that I realize that means God desires that I will be saved. Now, here's the third one. Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. But what really matters for me is to recognize that means that he gave himself as a ransom for me.
And my dear friend, while I can't see you tonight, you can only see my image on a screen, I can't look into your eyes, I can just look into a camera. But if I was able to peer into your soul tonight, I would just love to communicate this truth that the Son of God, this man, Christ Jesus, he has done everything necessary so that you can be saved. He has given himself as a ransom. He has satisfied God. He has come. He understands your need. He wants to save you. And he has done everything necessary to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself to deal with the very root of the problem, sin itself, and to give you a righteousness and acceptance with God. You can be justified. You can be made clean and pure in the sight of a holy God because of this one who gave himself as a ransom for all. But the final truth. Jesus is the only way for us to be saved. Okay, now I started out by saying that I wanted to stress that we have here statements that are absolutely true. True for every individual. True for all time, true in every religious setting, every cultural setting, every historical setting, every geographical setting, every individual circumstance. Always true. Well, listen to this, my friend. Jesus Christ is the only way for a person's sins to be forgiven and for a person to be right with God. Now, let the truth of that sink in. That means it has nothing to do with religion, any religion. I'm not speaking against religion. I'm not promoting religion. This is independent of religion. Religion has nothing to do, nothing to do with a person being right with God. Now, that's not my opinion nor my religious view, for or against. It's just the truth. It's just the truth of the Bible. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says this, neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved john 14 verse 6 the words of the lord jesus himself he said this he said i am the way you notice that the way not a way or the best way i am the way the truth and the life and then just for emphasis, he went on to say, no man comes to the Father except through me. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only Savior for sinners. But it thrills me to be able to tell you tonight, he is the Savior for sinners. He is more than able to say, he saved me. And there's many others that are listening. I know the Christians there in Midland Park, and if they have the opportunity, they could tell you one on one personally. He saved them. But as I conclude tonight, could I just tell you from the depths of my heart the purpose of this message and the purpose of this meeting being held virtually is to bring to your soul this truth He can save you. He wants to save you. His desire is that you would be saved. He has given Himself a ransom. And tonight, as you're listening, if you would just surrender to the truth of the gospel and receive this person, God's word for it, you'd be saved. No matter if you feel saved or what you think, what matters is the truth. So as we conclude, I would just urge you respectfully, I would urge you to face the truth. This isn't watered down. It's not manipulated. There's no slant. There's no agenda. It's just simply the truth. There is one God. We are all lost. That means you're lost and I'm lost. We all need to be saved. But thirdly, it's God's desire that we'll be saved. Fourthly, Jesus became a human being and gave himself as a ransom to pay the price to set us free. And fifthly, Jesus is the only way of salvation. It's my prayer that you will come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and that you would receive the gift 
of eternal life. 